So we at least try to start on time. Uh, it is a delight to welcome you to the 14th. I used to say annual, but COVID took that word out of the vocabulary, but the 14th lecture. Uh, we're delighted to, to have former Congressman David Price as our speaker. Um, this was named for Thomas Willis Lambeth, who uh, many of you know is a class of 57, was the youngest administrative assistant to a sitting governor, Terry Sanford, went on to the H. Smith Richardson Foundation, where I first met him in 1967 when he was with others launching the Richardson Fellows Program, which is now known as the North Carolina Fellows Program. He went on from there to join L. Richardson Pryor as his administrative assistant during his long service in the U.S. Congress, and then came back, Tom did, to lead the Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation as executive director for 22 years, at the end of which, when he retired, they kept him on as senior fellow. He uh, was chair of the Board of Trustees, chair of the General Alumni Association Board, chair of the General Alumni Association's Tar Heel Network, recipient of a Distinguished Alumnus Award from the university, an honorary degree from the university, the William Richardson Davy Award from the Board of Trustees, the University Award from the UNC System, the North Carolina Award from the state of North Carolina. And uh, if that wasn't enough, when he retired from the Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation, they decided to endow multiple professorships in his name at the university. Uh, several years ago, a generous donor decided that not yet enough had been done and that he wanted to endow this lecture and thought in doing so, he would be doing something that would help inspire others to follow Tom and his leadership as, as an example. Now, the only thing I've been able to figure out that's left, he's not yet been uh, put on a coin or a stamp. So I guess that is uh, still out there. I'm going to... Uh, introduce the provost who will bring greetings. He has just recently completed his first year as provost, and he will be followed by Dan Gitterman, the longtime chair of the Department of Public Policy, who will also bring greetings, and then Farrell Guillory, uh, professor of the practice emeritus of the Hussman School of Journalism and Media, will introduce Congressman Price. So, Provost Clemens. Thank you, Doug. It's a pleasure to be here. Chancellor Guskowitz sends his regrets. He is attending a meeting of the ACC chancellors. I can't think what they'll be discussing. It's my honor to be here tonight to welcome all of you and the Honorable David Price to the 14th Annual Thomas Willis Lambeth Distinguished Lecture in Public Policy. The title, Democracy Beyond Elections, Institutions in Crisis, is a timely one. And I admire the clarity and the courage of conviction that the Congressman has evidenced in speaking out on behalf of our most cherished democratic values. We tend to think about democracy as defined by elections, by the act of voting. Of course, that is a core democratic practice and it is a signal of the value we place on the voice of individuals. But the ballot is not the only means for ex exercising voice in a democracy, not is, nor is going to the polls the defining democratic practice. The value and character of democracy lies in a commitment to deliberate and decide together. The idea that each vote matters must be rigorously defended, no doubt. But voting is not the beginning and the end of the democratic process. It is ideally a product of a democratic conversation that informs our commitments at the ballot box. That's the thing that Congressman Price has so eloquently said and so vigorously defended. Democracy is a habit and a practice. It requires institutions and practices of democratic talk that affirm our faith in one another and in our institutions. The increasing coarseness of our public square reflects an erosion of national and institutional goodwill. I hope it does not represent a loss of charity. There was a time when even if we agreed on little else, we agreed that a patriot 
was one who worked or perhaps died in the service of the public good. It is that commitment to pursuing the good of the whole in conversation with others that provides for us a faith that though we may lose the vote on a specific policy issue, we stick in the conversation because we believe in the institutions, we are committed to the practices, and we have faith in the habits of democracy that we ought to practice together. I was happy to see that word patriot reappear in E.J. Dion's column about David Price. It too is a word that has been coarsened, but the Congressman has shown us how we might recover it. To be a patriot is to put the good of the whole above one's individual preferences. And the same holds true of Congressman Price's commitment to civility. It is not about politeness or, sp or speaking by omitting sharp truths. It is the embodiment in the faith of the ideal promise of democracy. It is a kind of fidelity to our institutions and our democratic community that defines the beauty of democracy. Representative Price, let me add my praise to that of Dion. You are an institutional patriot. You have defended the vision of civility by saying hard things, even things that offend, in the name of protecting the institutions, habits, and practices that make up the democratic conversation. We are delighted you've agreed to speak to us tonight about the crisis of our institutions. And now Dan Gitterman will come to give remarks. Good evening. I'm told when you're squeezed between multiple speakers, you should just say thank you and good night. So thank you and good night. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students of UNC Public Policy, and especially the DC program that's joining us by Zoom, we want to extend our thanks to the Lambeth Lecture Committee for making tonight's lecture possible. It is indeed a special honor to have Honorable David Price as our Lambeth Distinguished Lecturer a UNC grad, a scholar, and a public servant, a model of a life of civic leadership. I would like to now introduce Farrell Guillory, who will introduce Dr. Price. Prior to coming to UNC, Guillory spent more than 20 years as a reporter, editorial page editor, and columnist for the News and Observer. Guillory was inducted into the North Carolina Journalism Hall of Fame and received the Edward Kidder Graham Award that recognizes public service for a member of our faculty, in honor that I was deeply proud to nominate him for, Farrell. Well, Dan, thank you for the nomination. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you remembering it. Hello, everyone. Thank, thanks for coming. As you heard, I'm Farrell Gilray. I'm a has-been uh, professor of the practice in journalism, and back in the day was the director of the UNC program of public life. And it's an honor and a pleasure to serve with my colleagues on the Lambeth Lecture Committee. And uh, let me add my appreciation to the anonymous gift that endowed the Thomas Willer, Willis Lambeth Distinguished Lecture in Public Policy. Tom, as you heard, has uh, contributed immeasurably to the democratic and civic life of North Carolina, including its great public university. I'll exercise a moment of, public, uh, of personal and public privilege to thank Tom for his initiative encouragement that undergirded my uh, 23 years on the faculty at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Our distinguished lecturer today is an alumnus of UNC Chapel Hill, and along with Tom Lambeth, an exemplar of this university's long history of generating public servant leaders. In uh, reflecting on David Price's career, my mind turned to an old and familiar line, often attributed without any evidence actually, uh, but often attributed to Francis of uh, Assisi, the 13th century mystic and founder of religious societies of men and women, Preach the gospel at all times, 
when necessary, use words. Well, David is devoted to democracy at all times, devoted to the task of making government by freely elected representatives of the people work, preaching effectively through his own engagement in the day-to-day -day march of democracy. Of course, he's used words. He has produced four editions of the Congressional Experience in an earlier book, Bringing Back the Parties. Both drew from his scholarly research and especially significant from lessons he learned in actually serving in political and governmental roles. David Price is both a professor and a practicing politician, an academic and a legislator, skilled at making progress through the arduous complex tasks, mixing both policy and politics of federal budgeting. He is a man of faith who applies his beliefs and ideals through a lifetime of pragmatic work in the public life of his state, nation, and world. And if you haven't yet, read the fourth edition of the Congressional Experience and pay special attention, learn from and admire his, his insightful and nuanced chapter on uh, religion and politics. He has taught political sciences to students at Duke University and he served as chair of the North Carolina Democratic Party. Through his long tenure in the U.S. House that began in 1987, he rose to chair the Appropriations Subcommittee on Housing and Transportation. And he has traveled widely to hold learning sessions with parliamentarians and other nations as the leading force in the House Democracy Partnership. Not insignificantly, he balanced his long public service with devotion to, his, uh, to the life of his family with Lisa and their two children. And as he represented North Carolina's fourth congressional district, he brought to a fractious, often clamorous American democracy, his intelligence, integrity, and ideals. So please join me as if we were students assembling for an early evening class in welcoming Congressman, Chairman, Professor David Price. Thank you. Thank you, Farrell, for those wonderful words. I'll uh, try to live up to them. That's uh, the kind of response I, uh, I think that introduction deserves. Break the establishment once and for all, proclaimed Representative Andy Biggs in a uh, fundraising email that he sent out in the middle of the repeated balloting to elect a House Speaker in January. A conservative should lead us, not another rhino establishment hack like Kevin McCarthy. Watching this spectacle, uh, where do one's sympathies lie? Not with the particular establishment under attack, at least not for me, and hardly for establishments in general. But what is striking about this rebellion? was its nihilistic uh, quality. Not about policy differences, really, or even personalities, but just about authority and discipline. As veteran Washington Post reporter Dan Baltz observed, the anti-McCarthy Republicans were part of the broad, part of the breed of politicians for whom social media, cable news, self-aggrandizement take precedence over the institutional obligations and governing challenges of being an elected official. Some of the protagonists went so far as to equate their rebellion with democracy. That was a particularly egregious error, a particularly serious misunderstanding of what democracy is and what in practice it requires. So this provides the point of departure for what I wanna talk about tonight, democracy and institutions or more precisely, the centrality of institutions to functioning democracies and the bearing this has on our civic obligation, whether as citizens or as members of institutions of governance. I'm very, very grateful to be able to 
deliver these thoughts, express these thoughts in the context of a Lambeth lecture. I've long admired Tom Lambeth as a uh, practitioner and a champion of democracy, as you've heard in both uh, governmental service and in the nonprofit sector. I'm also well aware of the distinguished citizens who have preceded me in this lectureship and the contributions they have made to the, to the commonweal. It's a, it's a great honor to join this, uh, this list. I'm grateful to the Lambeth Lecture Committee and the UNC Department of Public Policy for extending the invitation to me and for all the preparation that went into this event. Think institutionally. Political scientist Hugh Hecklow admonished in a path-breaking book 15 years ago. The failure to do so, he said, with people neglecting and dishonoring the longer term values of the going concerns of which they're a part, helps explain the dysfunction in various spheres of contemporary life. Hecklow didn't assume that such thinking would come naturally or easily because after all, we're surrounded all around us with institutional failures, regulatory lapses that endanger our, our safety, systemic racism, all too evident in housing, education, criminal justice, clerical child abuse covered up for decades, corporate profits pushed over the well being of workers and product quality. Many, many instances of institutional failure. Moreover, many of the fights that we've engaged in throughout our political lives have taken on the form of challenging institutional norms and practices. In the Congress of the 1950s and 60s, for example, institutional norms and structures gave inordinate power to senior committee chairs, mainly Southern Democrats, with markedly negative uh, impacts on civil rights and education and other policy issues. These institutional arrangements required major reform and they were successfully challenged in the 1970s. Gender equality, certainly much of the modern fight for gender equality has also taken the form of challenging deep seated norms and structures. In the workplace, the university, the church, governing bodies and other institutions across the society. So all of this may lead us to um, view institutions more often as the problem rather than the solution to the ills that we need to address and the values we hope to promote. And then there's a more deeply seated barrier than just failures of institutional performance to thinking constructively about institutions as vehicles for social advancement or sources of moral obligation. That is our cultural and ideological bias toward individualism as we view our place and make our way in the world. Individual assumes that the free individual is the basic unit of the political order with the protection of his or her life, liberty, and property as the state's basic task. The institutions of government are more often seen as a threat than as a help. Morality is often described as following one's conscience, answering an inner voice. This individualistic premise hasn't gone totally unchallenged in American political thought. During my teaching years, I developed an interest in communitarian thinkers who questioned the assumptions as to uh, how individuals are formed and what their fulfillment in society looks like. But communitarianism has remained a, a dissenting strain in American political thought confronting dominant ways of thinking similar to those that often stand in the way of thinking institutionally. If you're asked, for example, it, it, to name uh, an outstanding example of moral rectitude and leadership, chances are you'll think of someone who performed in a rather lonely fashion, took a lonely stand, resisted the pressures of conformity and collusion. We admire people who live that way, who, as we say, march to their own drummer. Jimmy Stewart exemplified the ideal in Frank Capra's classic film, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, as he confronted a veritable den of conspiracy and, con and, con and corruption with lonely and brave defiance. It shouldn't diminish our admiration, however, to note that 
Individual independence and dissent are not the whole story. We do not come into this world or live within it as unencumbered individuals. The institutions and communities within which we find or situate ourselves, starting with the family, decisively shape the identities and moralities and loyalties that we take with us into the world, including when we try to change the world. As modern men and women, to a much greater extent than our forebears, we do abstract ourselves. We abstract ourselves from the institutions of which we're a part. We become critical of those institutions. We set out alternatively to reform them or to loosen their constraints, but that's very different from assuming or asserting total autonomy. We are still enmeshed in institutional life and our ideas for change often come from what we assume the core values or missions of those institutions to be. And in any event, we're bound to recognize the centrality and indispensability of institutions to a function democratic society. No matter how radical our critique may be, we do not conceive of a society without institutions, an arid landscape without differentiation where isolated individuals struggle in vain. Hugh Hecklow describes our situation well. He says, I believe it's possible to imagine being more thoroughly modern and more deeply committed to institutional values. By thoroughly modern, I mean that one will probably continue to be distrustful of institutions or guard against their power over us, and rightfully so, given the harm they can do to us. However, I also think that we can achieve a saner way of life by more self-consciously learning how to think and act institutionally. Along with a prudent regard for institutional failings, a turning of thought and action toward institutional values could also prevent much harm and do much good. To clarify further, let me turn to two examples, two recent examples for public life of what it means to think institutionally, to frame our moral obligation in institutional terms. Now, these aren't necessarily typical of everyday institutional thinking, which often focuses on recurring obligations that all of us have as members of a family, a religious group, a profession, or a governing body. By contrast, my examples are dramatic. They show people reacting under duress, understanding that the democratic institutional commitments that they profess are in jeopardy. First, consider my former colleague, Representative Tim Ryan, and the concession speech he made on losing a hard fought Senate race in Ohio last November. Now, concession speeches are rarely memorable, but this one took an unusual turn. Here's what he said. I have the privilege to concede this election. That's what Ryan said. And then he went on. When you lose an election, you concede. You respect the will of the people. You can't have a system where if you win, it's a legitimate election. And if you lose, somebody stole it. Well, Ryan's meaning, of course, wasn't lost on anyone. Donald Trump's election denial had recast concession as a sign of weakness and disloyalty, but Ryan was reaffirming long-term democratic norms that upheld election integrity and the peaceful transfer of power. In that sense, it was indeed a privilege to concede, to live in a country where the rule of law prevails and to have the opportunity, even in bitter defeat, to affirm and strengthen that democratic value. For another example, consider Marie Yovanovitch, ambassador to Ukraine, 2016 to 2019. Yovanovitch was abruptly recalled in 2019 by President Trump because of her failure to support his efforts to pressure Ukraine to investigate the business activities of Hunter Biden, son of Trump's prospective 2020 opponent, and to promote the discredited theory that it was Ukraine rather than Russia that had interfered in the 2016 presidential election. Yovanovitch has written an account of the smear campaign that Rudy Giuliani and other Trump associates, along with their Ukrainian collaborators, mounted against her. She held fast to the anti-corruption 
stance that was established U.S. policy, refusing to intervene, for example, on behalf of a discredited former Ukrainian general prosecutor, Viktor Shokin, whom Giuliani wished to bring to Washington. Yovanovitch felt bound, she said, by the procedures and laws that apply, quote, when a known corrupt person applies for a visa. As the conspiracy deepened and Trump and his inner core became more, inner circle became more directly involved, it became clear that Yovanovitch's uh, uh, ambassadorship was at, at stake. After efforts to get Secretary of State Mike Pompeo to defend her and her mission failed, Yovanovitch was advised by Undersecretary David Hale and by Ambassador to the European Union Gordon Sondland to issue a statement expressing her loyalty to Trump. Put out a tweet about how much you love him, Sondland recommended. Yovanovitch's rejection was telling. Here's what she said. I thank Sondland for his advice, but I couldn't imagine any Foreign Service officer following it. It was another suggestion for a loyalty oath and an even more partisan version than the one David Hale had suggested. I couldn't do it. She couldn't do it because of the position she held and the norms and obligations that surrounded it. She was thinking institutionally. I worked with Ivanovich briefly during the time uh, when I led a delegation from the House Democracy Partnership to Kyiv. Uh, HCP is a, is a bipartisan commission of the House which emerges, which engages peer to peer with uh, legislatures in emerging democracies to increase their effectiveness. I'd resumed the chairmanship of HDP when uh, the 2018 elections flipped control of the House, and we took an April trip to Eastern Europe to engage the parliamentary, uh, our parliamentary counterparts in Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, and Armenia. Timing wasn't ideal for Ukraine, which was awaiting the runoff election that would produce uh, the new president, Volodymyr uh, Zelensky. But we nonetheless had good meetings with a range of parliamentarians. And I remember thinking as the ambassador sat by my side on April 15th, sat at my elbow, I had seldom had better guidance in understanding to whom we were talking and what would be the productive lines of uh, discussion. Little did I imagine that in just nine days, she would be recalled. Yovanovitch later became the single most important witness in the Trump impeachment inquiry. Before turning to other governmental institutions, including the one in which I served for 34 years, I want to briefly reflect on the institution in which we're situated tonight, uh, the university. Yuval Levin, whose recent book, A Time to Build, is another powerful brief for thinking institutionally, suggests that we have three expectations of universities as institutions, complementary, but often in tension with one another. Universities are simul simultaneously the purveyors of the skills our economy requires, the moral demands of a just society, and the deepest and best wisdom of our civilization. Levin argues that those institutional roles are now tilted toward moral activism on many campuses and distorted by identity politics and a dogmatism that forecloses free inquiry. Hugh Hecklow articulates quite another concern about academia, namely that the pursuit of critical thinking might corrode basic institutional understandings and commitments. Devoid of institutional appreciations, he observes, the vaunted intelligence associated with critical thinking is really a way of not knowing. Well, without dismissing or minimizing such concerns, I believe they are not characteristic, they were not characteristic of my own experience, my own university experience, nor do I think they necessarily define that experience today. I don't believe, for example, that this requires a lot of fixing by the UNC Board of Trustees. In fact, though I would never have characterized it this, that way at the time, I, I believe my undergraduate experience on this campus involved a great deal of institutional thinking, inspired by what I encountered in the classroom, by my involvement in religious organizations and student government, and by the currents swirling around outside, dominated by the struggle for civil rights. My generation was challenged, and we needed to be challenged, by the dissonance between our received values and ideals 
religious, social, political, and the realities of American life, including the performance of our institutions. Our discussions were characterized neither by withering skepticism nor by political correctness, but we were critical, sometimes radically so, of the way our community and our country, the ways our community and our country were falling short of the values they professed. That's what's supposed to go on in the university. I would hope the university still provides that kind of setting and stimulus for thinking institutionally and in that sense prepares students for lives of attentive citizenship and political engagement. Whenever I'm asked how I first got involved in uh, politics, my basic answer goes back to my first, doesn't go back to my first campaign or other seminal events, it, it goes back to this campus, to those Chapel Hill years when the die was cast. Now, by no means was it guaranteed that I would uh, ever run for Congress, but coming of age politically when I did and in the way I did, and after all, it was only three years, three years after picketing theaters in Chapel Hill that as a staffer, I crowded into the Senate gallery and saw the Civil Rights Act of 1964 passed. Uh, these experiences guaranteed that I would recognize the centrality of politics and government to social change for the rest of my life and that I would find a way to be personally involved. That is still the kind of experience the university needs to provide, both for the sake of the citizens it is forming and for the society and its institutions, which require constant renewal. Turning now to institutions of governance, we recognize both the centrality of institutions to the practice of democracy and the unmistakable signs of institutional decline. The episode that I started with uh, tonight the spectacle of a majority party unable to elect a speaker is evidence, I would suggest, of a hollowed out political party. With members pursuing their own agendas, unmoved by unifying principles or the requirements of governing. The Trump presidency offered many examples of the same phenomenon, starting with the capture of the Republican Party by Trump himself, a celebrity devoid of any history with or attachment to the party, and including the later failure of party elders play anything like the role their counterparts did years before when they advised Richard Nixon that the time had come for him to resign. Democratic Party, I would suggest, is somewhat less hollowed out. I'm inclined to cite the nomination of Joe Biden in 2020 as evidence of, of this, uh, as well as the remarkable legislative performance of this 117th Congress over the past two years, uh, despite razor thin Democratic majorities in, uh, in the House and a 50-50 Senate. I can't uh, deny though that I've experienced a fair amount of anti-establishment veering on anti-institutional thinking uh, in party circles over the years as I've advocated for the inclusion of elected officials in, uh, in our party conventions, the so-called superdelegate controversy. In any event, Levin makes the intriguing assertion that growing partisanship is a sign of weaker parties, not stronger parties. Modern parties, he argues, have become deprofessionalized, cannot control their own internal processes, and are increasingly exposed to the power and pressure of politically, political celebrity culture. The increasingly unmolded political culture then sets raw partisanship loose upon society. Now, of course, there's a balance to be struck. In an earlier era, uh, there was a case, strong case for democratization within the parties. But contemporary American politics would gain coherence and responsiveness if the parties regained a measure of their institutional strength. The relationship of thinking institutionally to democratic governance is perhaps most obvious with respect to legislatures. In engaging with fellow parliamentarians uh, from emerging democracies through the House Democracy Partnership, we've developed a mantra, it goes something like this. Free and fair elections are essential to democracy, but what is equally or more important is what happens between elections. Where you develop effective, inclusive, legitimate representative institutions that translate needs and interests across the society into public policy, or you do not. 
Elections do little good for democratic development if the institutions that are charged with carrying out the popular mandate are ineffective or unresponsive. That has set the terms of our cooperation with uh, our partner countries. To share experiences and best practices, understanding that institutional forms vary from country to country, but they have the common purpose of realizing democratic aspirations. The strong institutional history of the US Congress was on display as I started out in politics, both in the way the institution was run and the challenges facing reformers. It was also reflected in the leading academic analyses. Richard Fenno's landmark studies of the House and Senate Appropriations Committee adopted a functionalist framework, stressing member socialization and adaptation to well-established norms and procedures. UNC political scientist, uh, Donald Matthews, were in the same vein about the US Senate, describing the folkways of the institution, the unwritten rules of the game, the norms of conduct, the approved manner of behavior, just like as one senator put it, living in a small town. It was a sign of the changing character of the institution as well as changing fashions in social science research that subsequent studies were more inclined to utilize what we now call a rational choice model, portraying members as purposive individual agents in a fluid organizational setting, utilizing assumptions more characteristic of economics than sociology. The landmark study here was Congress, the Electoral Connection by David Mayhew. Assuming members to be single-minded seekers of re-election, Mayhew demonstrated a close fit between the behavior such an assumption would predict and the way Congress actually performed. A number of developments made an individualistic portrayal of Congress an increasingly plausible one. The folkways that kept members in their place for the lengthy period of apprenticeship and deference to leaders and policy specialization, those things gave way as members found themselves largely on their own electorally. They were no longer able to rely on party machines and they faced the rise of television, direct mail and other technologies that offered them unmediated contact with voters, but also offered their opponents the same. Members were motivated to gain visibility and leverage earlier in their congressional careers and to press for the dispersal of power and prerogatives within the institution. This led to the democratization of committee uh, operations, proliferation of subcommittees in the 1970s. It also prompted a strengthening of house party leadership first as a counterweight to those committee oligarchs, but then also as a corrective to the problems decentralization posed for mobilizing the chamber and realizing members' policy goals. The period of my congressional service, uh, starting in the late 1980s, has seen an intensification of these dual developments. The advent of talk radio, cable television, and social media has provided more and more pressures and opportunities for members to focus outside the institution, to cultivate large followings, and given the ideological bent of many of these outlets, to establish their anti-government, anti-institutional credentials. A new breed of members has emerged distinguished by a huge social media presence. Democrat Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez came to the house with 9 million followers on those platforms more than four times the number claimed by the Speaker of the House, uh, Nancy Pelosi. Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene raised $3 million in small donations in the first quarter of 2021 alone, often providing her followers accounts of the fines she was incurring for her refusal to wear a mask on the House floor during the COVID pandemic. As Levin observes, many members of Congress have come to understand themselves most fundamentally as players in a larger cultural ecosystem, the point of which is not legislating or governing, but rather a kind of performative outrage for a partisan audience. Let me quickly add, I think this overstates the case somewhat or more precisely, it overgeneralizes about the posture this kind of member is likely to adopt toward the institution. There is a range of possibilities. It was already clear by the time I arrived in 1987, that those of us who regarded ourselves as workhorses, to use Sam Rayburn's uh, famous distinction, those of us who wanted to be workhorses, we were also gonna have to a considerable degree be show horses. 
uh, presenting and promoting ourselves in a changing media and political environment, that is if we intended to survive. In other words, the dichotomy was not absolute. Simply toiling in obscurity was not an option or not a viable option. Now, of course, show horse is something else. Again, the show horse temptations and incentives surpass anything my cohort ever dreamed of. But it's still possible to combine a, a strong and savvy media presence with a serious legislative role. I will argue that in fact, it's important to do that. But there clearly is a possibility of massive distraction from governing. And what Kevin McCarthy faced in January provides an apt illustration of the dynamics and dangers in play. The second major development, the, the modern house's march toward centralization took a major leap in 1995 when Speaker Newt Gingrich imposed the greatest concentration of leadership power in a century. But there were other forces pushing successive speakers in both parties in the same direction toward greater centralization. The need to um, counter the centrifugal forces in the political and media environment and increasing polarization that made cross-party cooperation less likely. The close competition between the parties with little margin for error a repeated crises, both natural and man-made, which forced leadership to the leadership level, all that pushing toward a more centralized uh, institution. Now, thinking institutionally about these trends is likely to provide, produce some ambivalence and some debate. What strengthens the institution in some ways may weaken it in others. For example, the march toward centralization has come at the expense of committees, of the committee system. And has resulted in the loss of the capacity to engage members, the, uh, to in incubate innovative policies, to facilitate cooperation, uh, uh, which committees often do foster. Uh, I don't regard leadership strength and committee vitality as absolutely or necessarily a zero sum proposition, but it's going to take some work and some good institutional thinking to bring them into better balance. Now, what alternative roles do these developments offer to individual members? There's considerable slack in the system compared to most parliamentary bodies. Members face numerous conflicting pulls, electoral constraints, group and constituency pressures, and party importunings, but they still have considerable leeway in determining what roles they assume. What kind of member shall I be? This is not merely a matter of personal preference. It's fundamentally a question of moral obligation. The Congress is integral to our system of constitutional government. It's the first branch of government responsible for securing the country and promoting the common weal. It's not merely a political way station. It's not a platform for its members' performance. It is an institution entrusted to its members, which they are bound to protect and uphold. So whatever obligation members may have to their conscience, their constituency, or their political creed, they are also obligated to think institutionally. Rather than pose as outsiders, they need to think about what it takes to be a serious and conscientious insider. First members should ask, to what extent and in what fashion will I contribute to the work of the legislature? The inducements to engage seriously in the work of the Congress have eroded. The distractions, many of them politically profitable, abound. Pulling one's weight in committee and developing a substantive area of expertise are still sub serviceable strategies for uh, members who desire the esteem of their colleagues. Members still have incentives to latch on to a piece of committee or subcommittee policy turf and to cultivate an image of, uh, of leadership. But the rewards for engaging in the painstaking work of legislative craftsmanship and coalition building are harder to come by, partly because of the decline of committees and the incentives to seek out serious discussions and to do one's homework. Those incentives may pale before the pressures of fundraising and the lure of social media. Moreover, the public often just doesn't seem to care. They're only sporadically attentive. The electoral payoffs may be just as great for just taking a position or just introducing a bill or touting one's party loyalty, or alternatively, declaring one's independence of the swamp, those rewards may be greater than the rewards for substantive or ambitious or consequential efforts. 
Secondly, and more specifically, members should ask, what responsibilities do I bear for the functioning of the committee and party systems and for Congress as an institution? Assuming that the committees and the parties play a legitimate and necessary role in developing and refining measures, in aggregating interests, in mobilizing the chamber, shouldn't the member who violates the comedy and the discipline necessary for these components of the institution to function, shouldn't that member bear some burden of justification? I'm not counseling simply marching in lockstep, of course. Conflicts that members have with party or committee leadership must sometimes be resolved in favor of one's convictions regarding constituency interests or the common good. Certainly no leader has the right to demand action based on deception or distortion of the truth. Party regularity has its own ethical pitfalls, including the possible contradiction of broader institutional responsibilities. And as I said earlier, institutional arrangements and practices themselves must be subjected to ethical scrutiny. And I suggested the former domination of Southern chairs was one such uh, institutional arrangement. Having said all that though, the need remains for a conscientious balance between autonomy and accommodation, between individual initiative and team play. More than most of the world's parliaments, the US Congress places the responsibility for striking these balances on the members themselves. The third question, tellingly, is one I added to the most recent edition of the uh, congressional experience. Uh, and the question is as follows, what responsibility do I have to assert and protect the constitutional role of Congress and the rule of law? Now, members who regard themselves as institutionalists have always, uh, always taken Congress's uh, Article I stata, stature seriously and regarded a robust exercise of its powers as an essential buttress of that position. But Donald Trump's challenge to the institution went beyond those of his predecessors in degree and in kind. Executive orders, emergency declarations, diversions of funds that flew in the face of congressional prerogatives, and then blocking and refusing to cooperate with investigations into his own conduct. And that was before his efforts to prevent Congress from certifying state electors after the 2020 election, seeking to deny the peaceful transfer of power. To their everlasting discredit, 139 of 213 House Republicans voted essentially to deny the election results. But I have to say that followed four years of toleration of the constitutional and legal incursions of a president who once declared, I have an article two where I have the right to do whatever I want as president. For example, you may remember Trump precipitated a uh, five week partial shutdown of the government in 2019 over funding for his proposed border wall. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell finally persuaded him to sign a funding bill to end the impasse, but the constitutional price was very, very steep. McConnell agreed to support a decision by a declaration by Trump that the border situation constituted a national emergency, which freed him to fund his wall independent of congressional appropriations. So much for institutional defense. Finally, members should ask, how should I position myself in relation to the working of the legislature and the overall performance of government? Richard Fennell focused on members' presentation of the institution as he traveled with House members around their districts. Here's what he said. In, in explaining what he was doing in Washington, every one of the 18 House members took the opportunity to portray himself as different from and better than most of his fellow members in Congress. No one availed himself of the opportunity to educate his constituents about Congress as an institution, not in any way that would hurt a little. To the contrary, the members' process of differentiating themselves from the Congress as a whole only served directly or indirectly to downgrade the Congress. We have to differentiate me from the rest of those bandits down there, Fennel heard a member say to a campaign strategy group. They are awful, but our guy is wonderful. That's the message we have to get across. And remember, this was in the 70s. This was before Newt Gingrich's a systematic effort to condemn the institution as corrupt and despotic. 
Now, the alternative is um, not to defend Congress uncritically to or, or ignore its failings. Indeed, members have an obligation to identify, identify the flaws and failings and to press for improvements. That's very different, though, than posing as the perpetual outsider, carping at all agreements and accommodations as though problems could simply be ignored or cost-free solutions devised or painful necessities of compromise avoided. Responsible legislators will not only communicate to their constituents the legislature's failings, but also educate and interpret as to what it is reasonable and fair to expect. This way it may well be accompanied by a negative assessment of what Congress has actually done or failed to do in a specific instance, but without self-righteous anti-institutional posturing. The moral quixotism to which re-election or media-minded legislators are prone too often serves to rationalize unproductive legislative roles and to perpetuate public misperceptions of the criteria that should reasonably apply to legislative performance. So although it may be politically profitable to run for Congress by running against Congress, the implications for the institution's legitimacy and effectiveness are ominous. Again, quoting Fennell, the strategy is ubiquitous, addictive, cost-free, and foolproof. In the short term, everybody plays and nearly everybody wins. Yet the institution bleeds from 435 separate cuts in the long run, therefore, somebody may lose. Congress may lack public support at the very time when the public needs Congress the most. My work through the House Democracy Partnership with some two dozen emerging parliamentary democracies has given me some perspective on this interpretive challenge and our country's institutional legacy. Nowhere in the world, I can say this categorically, nowhere in the world are legislative bodies popular institutions. That's hardly surprising. They feature constant conflict and bickering. They uh, have confusing and convoluted procedures. In many of these countries where we're working, uh, parliament literally represents the alternative to fighting in the streets. Parliamentary democracy is messy. It's probably too much to expect legislatures uh, ever to be loved by the public, but we should strive for understanding and respect. The, under, the underpinnings of public legitimacy. As members, we contribute or detract by the way we conduct ourselves, how seriously we attempt to govern, and also how we interpret the work and portray the institution to the various audiences that we address. Finally, it's often touching, it's often been touching to, to recognize, realize the esteem in which others hold our country and its uh, democratic institutions, despite our manifest failures and flaws. In dealing with partner institutions, we have never assumed that our constitutional design is ideal for their situations, nor have we hesitated to acknowledge the ways in which uh, our own institutional performance falls short. Democracy is always a work in progress uh, for all of us. Still, we recognize the uniqueness of our institution's 230 year history. We honor that legacy, even as we attempt to move beyond it, correcting failures and striving to contribute to a more perfect union. That's what it means to think institutionally. And our future depends on our ability to adopt that mindset within institutions of governance and throughout public life. Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, okay. I'm going to sit down. David, thank you for that thoughtful and thought provoking Lambeth lecture. Uh, before I step aside and let Professor Andrews uh, facilitate the q and I want to ask all the members of the Lambeth Lecture Committee who are present to uh, stand and be recognized. Would you all stand, please? And most importantly, I'd like one of them to uh, stand again because uh, this lecture would not be possible if it weren't for Thomas Willis Lambeth. Tom, please stand again. Let us recognize you.
Congressman, we're live. Congressman Price has kindly agreed to answer questions. So there is a mic back in the corner there. If anybody wants to go to that, or I will try to you know, relay questions. You just re repeat them for the uh, Zoom audience and the record uh, if people have questions. Yes. close friends and have been friends in college. My question is, does any of that exist today in the present Congress, relationships between an R and a D? Yes, it still exists. It's uh, not as common. Uh, and uh, there's no question that these political and party divisions do, do affect individual relationships. But um, the, uh, the, the the situation with respect to members of, of the of the other party is uh, is very mixed. I think uh, among members, as far as I'm concerned, I've been fortunate to have my two leadership positions in parts of the institution that are less uh, consumed by partisanship. The House Democracy Partnership, which I've referred to, is totally totally nonpartisan. So I've had a close, cordial and close working relationship with uh, the successive chairs and co-chairs of uh, of HDP. And then appropriations, you know, the day, the, the time was back um, when Fennel was writing about the committee, it was a, um, it was a bipartisan committee and it performed an institutional function, the power of the purse, and often had bipartisan support uh, that those days are gone, but we still have um, some of that, some vestiges of that in the way we put our bills together. And so I've had a cordial working relationship, either as chairman or as ranking member with uh, my my Republican counterpart on that on that subcommittee. So, my own experiences have been uh, have been mixed. Uh, I do think uh, some of the newer members have uh, spent less time, have less regard for uh, getting to know colleagues, uh, just just learning their way around the institution. That's one of the things that um, I think has been uh, uh, re regrettable. But uh, it, it's certainly not totally foreign the kind of relationship you describe. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm uh, not a political historian. However, I've been an observer, at, in some cases as close and, and others at far. And you've had a tremendous uh, career and a, a lengthy tremendous career, I might add. And I'm just curious, it seems to me that now we're so entrenched because we're all focused solely on what we disagree on. And it's interesting in, in the work that I've done, even people that may be 180 degrees from me on certain issues, uh, working vis-a-vis, -vis, we realized surprisingly what we did agree on, but because we were so focused on what we disagreed on, we really couldn't move forward on things. And you, I'm wondering if you can pick, if there's a time you can think of when that shifted uh, in Congress. Well, I might question your premise just a bit. There's no question these are bitterly partisan times and the polarization is extreme. And as I've suggested tonight, it's, uh, it's somewhat asymmetrical. I think the, uh, I think the ideological extremism and the uh, kind of nihilism has, has gone a good bit further on the Republican side than it has on the Democratic side. I think it's quite remarkable that we had the achievements, uh, some of them with bipartisan support, the achievements in the last two years that we had with uh, um, such narrow democratic uh, majorities. I'm, I'm very, very proud of that. And to find anything like that, you'd have to go back to Congresses where the democratic majority was much, much more, more substantial. So uh, uh, I do think the president has at some time has been successful in identifying areas where there is uh, common ground to be found. I think that was true in the infrastructure area. I think it was true to some extent in the uh, computer plus science bill, the uh, the, the bill to uh, shore up American high-tech uh, manufacturing. 
there were there was some common ground to be found there and and in the omnibus appropriations bill lest we forget i was there till december 22nd voting on the appropriations bills that should have kicked in on October 1. And, you know, it's a it's a sign of where we are that you consider it a success if you're only three months late. But that is uh, that is exactly where I was, believe me. And I was very, very happy to see that uh, appropriations bill passed. And it passed with very little help from House Republicans, but with a lot of help from Senate Republicans, some of whom did pretty well in the bill, I must say. But in the end, it was worth it because... Um, because the, uh, the the government is going to be funded in a, in a in a more adequate way, with all the benefit of the work that went into those appropriations bills. So uh, um, there there still is you know, and we we're not going to change our constitutional system. No matter um, no matter what, we're going to have to come together to keep the government open. Basically, <laughs> we're going to have to come together, have some bipartisan capacity uh, with divided government. We don't have a parliamentary system. We don't have a unified government. We often had divide, divided party control as we do at this moment. And so um, there's um, there's a lot of room for mischief and recalcitrance, and there's a, a lot of room for leadership and cooperation. And I, I certainly think this next couple of years is gonna be a test of that. Other questions? Yes. Dr. Price, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us to, tonight. Um, one question that we were just talking, you just mentioned your time passing the omnibus bill. A lot of us are concerned about this impending debt ceiling crisis. To what extent do you think some of the institutional problems that you've highlighted are going to impact the next few months of negotiations between the White House and the Congress? I'm afraid they're gonna have a huge impact. All we were asking of the Republican party in January was to get your own act together, elect a speaker, do, do the basic responsibility of, uh, of governing. A debt ceiling is gonna require some cooperation uh, between the parties. I, I mean, what needs to be said, I suppose, is that we shouldn't be voting on the debt ceiling in the first place. I think, heading the list of institutional reforms would be to eliminate that vote. No other industrialized country has it. It, it serves no purpose except just as a political uh, political football. And, and uh, of course, Republicans voted to raise the debt ceiling three times in the Trump presidency. And now, of course, they won't. But the, uh, the, the negotiations um, are, uh, are going to be difficult. And uh, I, I remember the uh, I remember the uh, agreement that it took to raise the debt ceiling early in the Obama presidency, and we were saddled with a, a set of budget caps um, called the uh, I guess the Budget Control Act, the BCA, for ten years. What that necessitated really was just negotiating to get around those caps so that we could keep the government open. But it was a huge uh, drag on. Uh, appropriations and budget uh, performance. I hope nothing like that comes out this year, but uh, the debt ceiling is, is just an invitation to political mischief. We shouldn't be voting on it. And it should be something that we do. We pay the country's bills. We do it without, uh, without attachments and without preconditions. Uh, David is both a professor of political science and a member of the House, you have both an inside and an outside view. I'd be particularly interested in what you think of the possibility of uh, institutional changes in institutional procedures to solve some of these problems. I have in particular mind uh, California's experiment with uh, ranked uh, open primaries to, uh, with the hope to uh, reduce some of the polarization that comes out of the primary system. Well, there's been a, a lot of um, a lot of speculation about what the effects might be of uh, more widespread adoption of the California system, where the top two candidates move to the general election, even if they're in the same party. The the theory being that this um, encourages voting uh, for the moderate candidate, more moderate uh, candidate. Uh, I don't know that that's 
worked out that way. Um, it strikes me that it probably hasn't. I mean, I, I, I'm sympathetic with the, uh, the, the, the uh, Alaska system is another one where uh, you indicate your second choice and your third choice. And, 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 and then the, uh, that, that, that too is supposed to encourage, uh, uh, encourage more uh, the, the emergence of, uh, of more moderate candidates. And, and indeed it may have worked that way in Alaska in their, in their most recent uh, house election. So I'm, uh, I'm not an expert on these things. There, there are lots of political scientists uh, who have uh, spilled a good bit of ink over this. And it is worth uh, it is worth uh, debating. I think I, I I guess I don't think it's a uh, I don't think it's a silver bullet. Hmm. Um, well, when uh, the American Political Science Association formed an advisory committee to uh, to uh, come up with uh, uh, congressional reforms, uh, the only one that they could uh, well they agreed on two two things. One was the one I just said, they agreed that we shouldn't be voting on the debt ceiling. And secondly, they agreed that uh, congressional earmarks or designated spending and appropriations should be brought back, which which actually now we have done as as, as well. The idea being that that would smooth the way to passage and, and uh, lead to uh, more uh, more support for, uh, for the funding bills, ease the pressures of uh, budgeting. Um, I... Uh, I wish I had a list of congressional reforms. I mean, there there, there are nostrums out there that I think don't uh, don't hold up. Things like uh, line item veto for the president, uh, term limits. I mean, there's a whole list that that people have, most of which I think don't hold any promise and would actually uh, make things worse. Um, it's it's hard for me to come to any other conclusion than that uh, the, the, we 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 need we need for the parties. We need two normal political parties in this country. Okay, we need a we need a center right party and we need a center left party, and uh, the the uh, the whole country has a stake, I think, in the Republican Party getting a hold of itself, and and reconstituting itself as a serious political party. Uh, I, I I just don't know any other way to put it, and any of the um, any of the procedural reforms that we could talk about I think would pale in significance beyond you know in in uh, face of what I'm what I'm talking about there they're just there uh, and and maybe maybe it will emerge maybe maybe uh, this is maybe we've experienced the um, with, with the with the effort to get past Donald Trump and to get past uh, that uh, that style of politics maybe uh, maybe the uh, maybe the party can reclaim some of that middle ground but but we'll see. I think there's a lot riding on it. I think we have time for one more question out of the middle here. Uh, Mr. Price, thank you for coming out and speaking to us. Um, now that you are no longer in the House of Representatives, um, I just wondered uh, throughout your tenure, now as you look back, if there are any themes or specific items that you or your fellow colleagues worked on that stand out to you um, now in hindsight or in the moment, besides of what you just talked about or the, t the trajectory of our institutions, et cetera. You, you, you're talking about uh, legislative achievements? Yeah, well, I've been asked that a good bit, you know, in these uh, closing weeks as, as we look back on uh, what, um, what I've uh, been able to do or tried to do in a in a in a long career, and uh, things do uh, sort out, I think, into into two categories. One is the team efforts that have been particularly rewarding, and the other is the uh, the individual efforts that uh, I particularly value and and want to see uh, uh, built upon. Um, the 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 team efforts are uh, are often they're they're concentrated in the periods after we've elected democratic presidents and have had large house majorities, even though uh, the ones that we've done the last two years, as I said earlier, are not, uh, weren't, weren't done under equally favorable political conditions, but nonetheless, uh, we're, we're proud of those. But uh, I, will, uh, I will look back on the Affordable Care Act and the, uh, some, of the, some of the budget uh, accommodations made in the Clinton years, uh, the, uh, 
financial reform legislation, the, uh, the, the big investments in infrastructure these last two years. And I simply regret that uh, the parallel proposal to make a similar big investment in affordable housing did not, did not pass. But infrastructure was a was a good uh, a good initiative. So take a lot of satisfaction in, in those things and in in those efforts. I've simply been a, a team member. Um, the things individually that I've worked on are very uh, varied. You know, we, we we spent nine years funding this uh, environmental protection agency lab out in Research Triangle Park. Uh, just uh, a, 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 just a tremendous effort to get that uh, done. Um, I'll, I'll just say on the appropriations committee, I, you, you know, what appropriators specialize in is funding increases and decreases rather than, uh, than blockbuster legislation. And, uh, I take a lot of satisfaction in moving the ball year after year after year in areas such as, um, inner city rail, mass transit. Uh, the comeback of the Hope Six, uh, now called Choice Neighborhoods Program in housing for, for major redevelopment, elderly housing, housing for people with disabilities. I have uh, made it signature issues to, uh, to raise those things and to provide more funding and then also to work here at home to make sure we took advantage of this. So it's very satisfying now. We're gonna, we're gonna have passenger rail in the Southeast Corridor Raleigh to Richmond is next, and we're going to purchase that corridor and develop it. And I'm very, very happy about that. So you provide the funding increase in Washington, and then you hope that the state gets its act together, and the state of Virginia too, in this case. And we we've done just that. We just landed a forty million dollar choice neighborhoods grant for Durham downtown between Liberty and Main Street. It's going to be a wonderful uh, redeveloped area, and and so on. Um, this is the day-to-day -day work of, uh, of appropriations in, in particular. And I've never regretted that, uh, that I chose to be on that committee and, and that I hung around long enough to chair the uh, subcommittee I wanted to chair all along, which is the one on transportation and housing. It took a while, but it, uh, I got there. So thank you for the question. It gives me a, a kind of open book here, but um, I, uh, I, I'm happy to respond to any, any uh, you know, there's a, I put in my uh, I put in my uh, book the congressional experience. I I did include just to just as a reality check. I did include a list of things that I didn't get done. Things that uh, just never never could quite get over the finish line. Just so that there's some perspective about uh, how this goes, you know, and how you how you uh, win some and lose some. And uh, I I can. Um, I have a lot of um, a lot of things on that list as well, but there's been enough uh, success and enough encouragement to keep me going. And uh, throughout it all, I've been very, very grateful for the opportunity. It's, uh, of course, the dream of of my life to serve in this position. When I came down to Chapel Hill, first time I came down here was for the scholarship Morehead scholarship interview from Mars Hill. I rode eight hours on the bus and came to North Carolina for that interview. And uh, thinking back of the answers I gave, I cannot imagine why I got that fellowship. <laughs> uh, but somehow I did. And, uh, and then of course, uh, went off to graduate school and then came back with an appointment across the way at uh, the Duke University, a dream offer from uh, Tom Lambeth's and my dear friend, Joel Fleischman, and, uh, and of course, President Sanford. And uh, so came back here in, uh, in 73 with our, with our young family. But if you had said to me in 19, now, now I had thought in, in thinking about where I wanted to locate or where I would like to live. Yes, I thought about politics. I thought, I thought uh, yes, I'd like to be in the Mid-South. I'd had a wonderful experience here as a, as a student. So I was partial to, uh, Duke and Carolina and Vanderbilt schools of that of that sort and, and got this dream offer at, uh, at Duke. So I, I had political involvement in the back of my mind, but I would not have dreamed in a million years that I would represent this area in Congress about 12 years later. Thank so, you. yeah. 
right. whatever it is. But uh, it was uh, it has been a wonderful ride, and it's had um, a lot of ups and downs along the way. But I'm very grateful for it, and I'm grateful for the chance to be able to talk about it here tonight. Thank you. Let me. Let me invite you all to join Congressman Price in the lobby for in the rotunda for a brief reception. Thank you all for coming.